to the third of this year's Lent lectures, followed by the late night service of Compline. Uh, this evening's uh, Compline service is being sung for us by the Cathedral Chamber Choir, and um, uh, that will happen, as in the last couple of weeks, through in the choir in about an hour's time. But before that, we are here to continue our reflections on God at the ballot box, not fortunately the choices which God will be making and the views which he might be taking were he to be uh, voting, but the reflections which we as people of faith might take as we think about the forthcoming election to the, um, to the polls when we get there in a few months' time. When the group of us who were preparing to deliver these talks got together, it was very clear that among the topics we wanted to talk about was uh, education. Uh, the very famous quote there from Tony Blair from a few elections ago. And uh, who better to talk to us about this than Katie Fitzsimmons. Katie and the family moved to Salisbury last summer. We have got to know her as a friend, a neighbour, a congregation member, and Katie is also the Diocesan Director of Education. So heading up the work which uh, this diocese of um, Salisbury does across the church schools of Wiltshire and Dorset. There are 43,000 children in 191 church schools. That represents over half the pupils of Wiltshire and Dorset. So it is a, a huge responsibility and opportunity, and um, it must be lent because Katie tells me for her sins she is also chair of the National Dustin Director of Education's Network. So who better to talk to us about education, education, education? Please welcome Katie Fitzsimmons. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kenneth, for the opportunity to talk about something that is so close to my heart. Um, I had to be reminded of the timescales for this evening because, frankly, I could talk about education forever. Um, this is me. I am Katie. My uh, family live uh, very close by. My eldest son is halfway through, well, almost completing his sixth form. I have two other children in the school system locally. And so I get an insider view, as well as an overview in my role. If you peel back my layers, I am a secondary trained French and Spanish teacher. I am a little bit biased that this is a crucial area of national policy, but because its impacts are felt for generations, it matters to me and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to talk about it a bit more. So what's the definition of education? A start, but hardly relevant really, in the complexity of what education actually means for each of us. I wonder what your enduring image of education may be. This. This. Or this. Each of us has our own perspective on education, drawn from our own experience, good or bad, raucous or rowdy. My own example of being a ridiculously boring child who enjoyed school, worked hard and wasn't particularly difficult, led me to grammar school. My family then moved with my father's work, which took me to a comprehensive system where I experienced what can only be described as the royal flush of bullying characteristics. Being ginger, bespectacled, fat, clever, and insisting on wearing school uniform meant I was all too easy an object. I was unfortunately surrounded by folk who, who decided we could do some, but not too much, a cap on aspiration. I went to university, I persevered, and I succeeded. The alternative perspective was that of my brother, my parents deliberately moving him out of the selective system, knowing he would not pass the 11 plus, 
and that at that time it would consign him to a comprehensive, to a, a secondary system that would not provide him the same opportunities. This helped me to shape why it mattered for me to work in education. It brought me, eventually, to want to be a teacher, to become a head of department, an assistant head, a head teacher, to work as a school advisor, and eventually to end up here in what I can only describe as simply the best job in the entire world. But I wonder, what drives your interest? What is your perspective? And given that starting point, what do you think education is for? Are you with Nick Gibb? It's an engine for the economy. It's about making sure we can get a good job. Is that the point of education? Or perhaps this lady, Leora Crudders, who leads uh, an organisation representing school trusts, saying that we go beyond that utilitarian focus and see education as a good in itself, a place where children flourish as a rounded human being. Or more simply put, in UNESCO's slogan, education transforms lives. From scripture, we can look to Proverbs and take a little moment about acquiring knowledge and seeking it out. What is education for? My own teaching approach for languages, frankly, teaching Spanish to children who did not want to learn English, let alone Spanish, trying to find the joy with them, the way in, the opportunity, that they might love learning just because helping them to learn to love to learn, to grow, to share, to explore, to equip, not just for work. And as John reminds us in chapter 10, verse 10, to equip our young people for life in all its fullness. Given that then, what do schools do? I tried to capture a few elements here just to give a flavour of life in a school in 2024. Um, they provide food, they explain the news, they secure exam grades, they step in in disagreement between children, between families, they train teachers, they model healthy relationships, they do toilet training, they provide special educational needs support, careers advice. They manage multi-agency links, provide mental health interventions. Oh yeah, and they teach. And why all of those things? Well, because education doesn't just impact life chances, jobs, earnings, and prospects. It impacts life expectancy. An article in The Guardian in January of this year said, completing primary, secondary and tertiary education is the equivalent of a lifetime of eating a healthy diet, lowering the risk of death, death by 34% compared with those with no formal education. David Finch, a director for the Health Foundation, says we have really big health inequalities in the UK the gap in life expectancy between the least and most deprived areas in England is 9.4 years for men and 7.7 .7 years for women. And it isn't surprising that you see a significant difference when comparing by education level. Education really matters. So in addition to caring that our fellow humans live, healthy, happy lives, why else does education matter to us as Christians? Prior to the 19th century, most schools were run by church authorities, and in 1811, we saw the snazzily titled Anglican National Society for Promoting the Education of Poor in the Principles of the Established Church in England and Wales being established. 
unsurprisingly, a quick rebrand was required, and now it's the rather snappier National Society or the Church of England Education Office. That movement saw the instigation of schools across the country, provided for by landowners and the wealthy, saved up for by parishes and congregations, but rooted in knowing that all children deserved an education. Derived originally from the Sunday school network, go to school, then come to church. Under the Butler Act in 1944, those schools were absorbed predominantly into the state system, but many of those retained their Church of England foundation, reflecting their historic origins. So specifically now, the Church of England's education sector looks like this. Over was about a million children in Church of England schools. And you can see there the relationship to independent schools, the work of the clergy dedicated to supporting those schools. The second to last bullet point is about governors, over 22 and a half thousand governors, volunteers who support our schools. Some of you may fall into that category this evening. And lastly, that each diocese has a board of education which supports those schools, of which I am the director. Alongside this, we have over 2,000 Catholic schools, 80 Methodist schools, schools that are a combination of foundation. Many schools, particularly those in rural communities, trace their origins back to church support to found, to run them, and to sustain them. And what has this looked like for us in the Church of England, for my role in terms of uh, why education matters? This document here, the Vision for Education, outlines the Church of England's commitment to education. And when I go and talk to leaders in our schools, trust leaders and the DfE and all the other worthy people who want to talk about it, I will say to them, if I take the Bible quotes out, I know there is not one piece of this that you will disagree with in terms of why it matters that we do education well. But let's just take this section for us this evening. There are fundamental reasons rooted in the Bible, which have motivated centuries of Christian involvement in schooling in this country and around the world. The God of all creation is concerned with everything related to education, wisdom, truth, and knowledge, the learning and teaching of understanding, virtues, and habits that shape individuals, families, and communities. The worth of each person what is past from generation to generation? In whom and what people trust? What people hope for? And more. All things and all people are intrinsically related to Jesus Christ, and that sets the horizon within which he is to be understood and followed. It would be a narrow and unbiblical position alien to the traditions and practices of the Church of England to try and separate the life of the church from involvement in education. A pretty bold statement, but one that gives us a little bit of guidance, all of which is rooted in John 10.10, 10, which I shared with you early, life in all its fullness. So given this journey we have been on then, what is education? Why does it matter to you? What do schools do anyway? And what's your perspective? What are we up against in education? And what should we be listening out for in this election year to hear our politicians acknowledging the challenges faced by those in education? Education touches the lives of every child and young person, however obliquely, from preschool to university, and in so doing, it touches the lives of their families. So the issues are significant. I've outlined some of them here, so let's take a look at each one in turn. The first few you'll see are specifically around what's happening in school. The, the last three are more around those broader contextual elements, which really impact the settings in which schools find themselves. Teachers and schools in COVID were, on the whole, amazing. 
they found out they were closing when you did. I will never forget that press conference outside number 10 and thinking, right, I best get back to work then because we need to be ready for tomorrow. I saw schools shift their provision in a matter of hours to ensure there was something in place for 9am the next day. They moved into food delivery systems for children who were in receipt of free school meals. They acted as pastoral links and outreach points to check on families and reassure children that they were still there. And they had to get up to speed pretty quickly on how to teach 30 children online and remain sane. They did stationary drops, they did online worship, they did virtual parents' evenings and one-to-one -one calls. They provided safeguarding and social care links, with one quote from a boy in a school of mine thanking his teachers for helping him meet his new foster family because he didn't think anyone would want him in COVID. They didn't get it right every time, but they tried. They opened and closed and sort of opened and definitely closed in whatever guise was demanded of them. And when it came time to reopen, they were places of joy and delight. The sounds of children and young people back in schools remain some of the most poignant memories of teachers that I talked to about that time. But the damage is real and it is still very present. Development delays, speech and language needs, the learning of sharing and collaboration, lost building blocks of learning in reading, writing and maths, headlines here from the UK and the US, outline all the areas that we saw and continue to see having an impact. We also saw missed rites of passage, study leave, exams, proms, graduations, all important way markers on the journey of life for our young people and all pushed to one side. Also, and perhaps most importantly, we saw significant damage to what Leora Crudus refers to as the social contract between schools and families, a fracturing of relationships. We see attendance now at extremely low levels across the country and research points to this being directly linked to the impact of COVID. Financially, we saw families in deepening crisis and we continue to see this. The financial impacts are ongoing. The most recent Joseph Roundtree report tells us that there are one million children who experienced destitution in 2022. One million without reliable access to food and shelter. 70,000 children are living in temporary accommodation. How can children learn in these conditions? How can they flourish? The equivalent of all those children in Church of England schools across the country experiencing destitution. Financially, there have been ongoing real terms cuts to funding and education, some of which are easy to spot, others far less evident. The crisis in university education funding should trouble us, seeing our young people expected to be happy to turn 21 with 30k of tuition fee debt, plus any additional student loans that they may have taken out during that time. And if not a population with the chance for those who are able to become degree educated, then what? Sam Friedman in the top corner there points to what amounts to another financial car crash in slow motion, which will impact on schools, which hasn't yet received as much airtime as it might. The crisis in local authority funding. Why does this matter to schools? Ask anyone who leads a school with children who have an education, health and care plan who cannot access the expertise and professional support that that young person is entitled to. Ask a parent who no longer has access to funding for transport to the school which meets the needs of their child. Ask the teacher who knows they are providing specialist provision for children who should be in specialist provision. 
ask the professionals who know that in order to access mental health support, a child must be at imminent and regular real risk of suicide, not just self-harm. We heard something of this last week and it has real implications for our schools. Don't get me started on concrete and the crumbling nature of our school estate, the millions of pounds required to bring those classrooms and schools up to standard, let alone just getting them away from the dangerous state some of them are in. But we do see local authorities not too far from us having to decrease the size and remit of their education function. And this directly impacts the capacities of schools to function, from HR support to estates, from curriculum and moderation work to admissions, real issues which need real funding. We await the budget this week with bated breath. Tax cuts or investment? In the interests of the few or the many? A commitment to our young people or not? In this space as well, it would be wrong of me to not mention the issues we have around teacher training, recruitment and retention. We are facing a teacher recruitment crisis. We are seeing young teachers leave the profession and it is unsustainable. Any government, any politician who wishes to speak to you about education needs to acknowledge that and perhaps have a thoughtful plan of how they might address it. Accountability and outcomes, by which I mean Ofsted and exam results. Some of you will have seen in the news um, last year the desperately sad and tragic case of Ruth Perry in Reading and Caversham. And what did we see there? An accountability system which has simply gone too far where a head teacher cannot face another day because her Ofsted outcome will directly impact the house prices of the area that her school serves. We do need accountability, but we need thoughtful, compassionate and well-considered accountability which drives improvement, not destruction. And when it comes to outcomes, we need to stop trying to measure everything against an average or a normal distribution curve because that way we hard bake in the fact that a third of children will always fail and that not everyone can be better than average. And if you're not better than average, and Ofsted come to look, you're in trouble. Again, I would invite those seeking election to have a view, to have a thought. What does it mean? And how do we genuinely but compassionately hold our schools accountable for all they do? The increase in poor mental health is readily reported, but perhaps more worrying is an emerging trend of young people who feel deeply a sense of existential dread. A chaplain who works with university age students told me of the increasing numbers of young people who are seeing the future they were sold as a lie. They will not have a secure job. They will not be debt free. They will never own a home they will never retire. The ongoing war, climate change and instability bewilders them. An idealised lifestyle which perhaps some of their grandparents attained, but they will not. This chaplain told of how hard it was to talk to these youngsters and offer them hope where they saw none. They looked towards a hopeless future. What will we hear in government policy and election promises that may point our young people towards hope? Last week, we heard of health and social care having had seven secretaries of state attend since 2018. Education says, hold my beer. We too have had seven, but wait for it. We had five in one year. Five, how can this represent a positive political will for education to be anything other than a political football? Education and policy affects between 14 and 18 years of a young person's life. 
So how can we show responsible and long-term education commitments when leadership is seemingly regarded with such disdain? I actually bought this pack of cards, the Battle of Education Secretaries, um, for uh, some colleagues of mine. They're genuinely good fun, top trumps. Um, and then this came out, which was the 2023 extension pack. So you could get the additional five. <laughs> But its existence points to a real problem. The fact that we can do this is a problem. So given this, what can we do? If you're listening out for these themes over the coming six months, how can you be active in advocating for our education system? How can you connect with your perspective, your experience, what you bring, on a personal level, and how can you take those things and issues that I've presented you with and kind of want to understand more? How do we take that into that space? Well, I've opted for these three things. Now, first up, pray. And I ask this of you ardently and fervently, please pray. Pray specifically. Pray for the schools that are local to you, that you know, the schools that are related to your family, to your area. Pray for them by name. Pray for those who teach in them, those who support them, governors, teaching assistants, midday meal supervisors, cover supervisors, administrators. Thank them and pray for them. And before you do that, can I just say a huge preemptive thank you. Secondly, I would ask you to expect more. Expect education to be valued for what it is, for all it offers, for the vital role it plays in sustaining all areas of our lives, culture, academia, industry, health, politics, refuse collection, creative arts, the armed forces. Education sits alongside them all and enables our young children, our young people, to learn the value of learning, explore their own potential, as well as become someone who contributes financially, positively, however you want to phrase it within that utilitarian sense, into their community. Peter Hennessy says, the great question of UK politics is whether we can find the pessimism-breaking policies the people, the purpose, the language, the optimism to shift our system and replace it with something much closer to who we are and above all, who we can be. Expect more. Expect people to value education and the opportunity that it should offer. To live life in all its fullness is to know all its ups and downs, to be open to all life has to offer, and to know that you can, you're allowed. I worked extensively, extensively with young people on the topic of oracy, specifically teaching young people how to speak, to be able to stand and do this, but also to be able to hold their own in a conversation or debate with peers in a classroom, to give them permission to have an opinion and to give them the developmental opportunities to express it. The language of engagement, to disagree well, to respect the views of others. Sometimes I wonder if I might have done better to have spent some of that time with those in elected office to encourage them in the art of meaningful conversation. So do our politicians have high enough aspirations for our young people? Or is good enough good enough? Or not good enough good enough? And lastly, George. Well, recently I listened to a lady called Laura McKinney who told me about George. This is George Tomlinson. He was the post-war Secretary of State for Education. And despite having less than no money, 
and holding the role in a time consumed by the grief and confusion of the aftermath of the Second World War. He committed to raising the school leaving age and building hundreds of new schools. Why? Well, because he knew as the son of a weaver who had to leave education at 12, that education matters. He worked hard, he became a union official, he was later elected into his seat in Farnworth in Lancashire with one goal in mind, that one day he would get the chance to make a difference so that children like him would be able to access education and realise their potential. So whenever my job feels tough, I remind myself that George did it in far more challenging circumstances. Being courageous because we know it's right. Being challenging for the sake of those people who cannot express that need and that challenge themselves. Advocating for our children and young people. So as we draw towards a close, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. It's really easy to feel really bleak. There's no way of sugarcoating it. The challenges which we face in education are significant. They are crushing, they are overwhelming. For staff, for children, for families, there are overwhelming challenges. But education is a human right. It is the right of every child to access education. It is that simple. Our schools are overwhelmingly staffed by those who want to ensure they get that. They are blessed with volunteers who help them along the way. They work together to do the best by the children and young people they serve. COVID served as a useful reminder, actually, but the wider remit covered by schools has been coming evident over the last few years. Schools have picked up so much being the last institution that fa many families have contact with. Areas which have fallen out of health and local authority funding have dropped into the school's remit. So at some point, we have to accept that we cannot have more for less. Our schools need funding properly, alongside the services which they are trying so hard to make up for. This quote here came from a blog that I picked up last week. And I felt this was real encouragement to us in this series of lectures, particularly resonating with me around education. Despair is often a generalized feeling of gloom. To hope is to act specifically. People who bring hope understand the reality of the situation. They're not unaware of the difficulties, the brutal facts, but they have a plan. If you focus on the system making the job harder than it should be, then there are plenty of reasons to lose hope. If you focus on the people delivering in spite of it, then there are many reasons to keep on hoping. For me, those last few lines remind me of what I see in our schools day in and day out. Those folk working so incredibly hard to make the system work the best they can. He later goes on to say something which again resonates with this lecture series, that sometimes we're stuck just because we can't see the perfect way out of a problem. It's like unfolding and opening up an ordnance survey map completely, only to find that there are lots of white spaces where there should be some contours or some woods. And when this imperfect map is all you have to guide you, you have to make a start, even though you can only see the first few steps in front of you. Headlamps only light up the 50 yards immediately ahead of you, but normally that's all you need to see to make the longest journey. You don't need to see all the way, just peering through the murky windscreen. Holding on to hope can be a little like this. He closes with the words, we just need enough light for the next step of the journey. In these big issues that we have been discussing, it can feel incredibly overwhelming. 
I spoke to Mark earlier about the uh, climate justice session that we had, which started our series, and how it had really encouraged me that it could feel so overwhelming. And education, again, can feel like a massive thing. How can we affect it? And yet, we can. The simple question, the points of focus, and a relentless expectation that our politicians will do better by the children and young people of our country. I hope that these words are some encouragement to us all, that we do not feel overwhelmed by the scale of the challenges, and that we are reminded that we are blessed with the light of God's word to guide us as we seek to make a positive difference for ourselves, for our families, and for the children and young people who depend on us speaking up for them. Thank you.